Yeah, actually, this was um, the topic of my uh, Master of Music thesis. And that was many years ago. I graduated Master of Music in 1972. It was suggested to me by my uh, thesis advisor, that was uh, Dr. Uh, Corazon Diokino. Uh, you see, I have a previous degree in English, so AB English, and uh, this as well is putting together my interest in both literature and music. So it was suggested by um, yeah, Professor Diokino, and I just thought, yeah, I'll uh, do some exploratory research and look and see what I can find. So, of course, the first stop was the Filipiniana uh, Department of the Music, of the, uh, not music, of the, of the uh, University Library. So I went there and I was looking around and informing myself. And it was with the help also of the librarians that I discovered, yeah, Severino Reyes and the possibility of working on the music in his arzuelas. They gave me the address of Pedrito Reyes, that is the son of Severino Reyes, and uh, yeah, that's where how it all started. I went to see him, I talked to him, and then afterwards I went back to my um, thesis advisor and I said, yes, okay, I like the topic. So that was it. Yeah. The biggest thing they know or they don't know, well, I would say it's about this Arzuela, is that people always tend to think that this arzuela is only a piece of literature, when actually it is a combination of literature and music, because this arzuela without the music cannot be called a arzuela. It's simply a play, a drama, you know. And uh, it's you know in the same vein you would call let's say an operetta in German a Singspiel, or a musical. You need the music. It's very important. And people, when people, yeah, about this arzuela, I don't know, it's especially this arzuela. They, people often think, ah, oh, it's just a piece of literature, it's only literature. They tend to overlook the idea, the fact that music is important. Where my goals and intentions were exactly that, to make people realize that this arzuela, yeah, you involve literature, not only literature, but also music, and that the music is very important in it. Without music, it cannot be a sarsuela. So, and that was just my idea. And then I also did some research on previous uh, authors who have written about this sarsuela. And that's it. They hardly ever did any analysis of the music. And so that was what I wanted to do. Analyze the music, yeah, present it, present, present what I could, do what I can, do some analysis. And of course, yeah, yeah, show that music is very important. And uh, yeah, I think and I hope that I succeeded. Well, very important and which I found very interesting was meeting Pedrito Reyes himself. He is the son. You know, he was not very young anymore when I met him. He must have been close to 80. I'm not so sure anymore uh, how old he was, but he was not. He was not a dashing young man anymore. He was older. He was much older. He was a grandfather. And he had very interesting stories. Very interesting stories that I cannot say that he invented them or something. Because later on, I found out they were true. They were completely true. And um, quite interesting were his comments about the sarsuela, which he called Luxunang Dugo. He said, yeah, this Arzuela was hardly successful during the time of his father. Yeah, people didn't like it. The music was too, too highfalutin for them. It was too difficult for them to understand. And then he even said, it's like the music of Wagner during his time in Europe. People didn't like it. It was too difficult for them. But then later on, I made a little, some more researches, and I found out, yes, that's true. And that's the reason why this Arzuela was hardly ever performed. But then I also remember, that's why I quoted in the book, um, Machlis. Machlis is an American musicologist or music historian. And he said something, maybe I can read part of it later. He said something like, uh, um, the human ear, what you accept as a, a harmonic or consonant in music changes. So what you consider up to a certain point as dissonant, or I would say in layman's terms, you call it out of tune, 
would later be considered as consonant and you know acceptable and that's why I suggested maybe one should perform Luxon and Dugu again. Of course, the plot is a little controversial, but then, of course, well, we have to accept it was written at this particular time because it involves a love story between people who are related by blood. And uh, people might say, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, what can we do? That's the plot. Yeah, the point is, you see, the book is, uh, I would say, it is from a musicological point of view, written from a musicological point of view, which means that if you have no background in music theory, for instance, you will have difficulty understanding the book because it's highly academic in that sense. Of course, the first part, the historical part, okay, you can read it. The last, the end. The last uh, chapter also, yeah, fine, because it's a summary and evaluation. But in the middle, when you have a, a theoretical analysis of the music, um, the readers may have problems. When I start talking about, let's say, a dominant seventh or a diminished, dom diminished seventh chord, or of a even of a simple thing like a coloratura, no, or of uh, yeah, what else? You know, these are. Uh, technical terms in music, when I think talk about the technical terms in music, they might have difficulty, or the appoggiatura, for instance, they might have uh, difficulty understanding that. And with that is, yeah, that's the, that could be a problem. But on the other hand, uh, you see, UP Press is an academic. Um, it publishes academic works, and this would fall into it. It's that something for, for a reader who would buy, let's say, a Harry Potter, Harry Potter novels, or yeah, or things like that. It's for some people with, who have more, let's say, a background in music, and not just background in terms of performance, but in terms of uh, musicology or music theory. Uh, that I wouldn't know. It would be difficult to answer that question. But going back to the previous one, yeah, I was talking about music theory. Now maybe I can just elaborate a little. Um, you see, I don't live in the Philippines, I live in Germany. And then one time I was in London, and I was just curious. And um, I asked the store, and I went to a music store, and I asked them uh, yeah, about books in music theory. And they showed me a big book, big, uh, it was written by Walter Piston. And when I saw it, I said, oh, I know that from my, from my music days in the UP because that was what we used in the UP, in the College of Music, as our theory book. It was like a Bible, you know. And they were using it, and that's what I, you could buy in, um, in London. It was this Chapelle Music Store in the New Bond Street. And they told me, this is the theory book we use in the United Kingdom. Then I realized, oh, in English-speaking countries, that's the theory book they use, because in Germany we have a different one. We use the one by Wilhelm Mahler, and, uh, well, it's basically the same. Yeah, basically, but there are differences. And so, no? Yeah, well, yeah, but the questions, yes. Yeah, what method did I use? Yeah, it was Walter Piston's method. Yeah, which is, that's what I used when I, when I took my uh, music here in the, in the UP, you know, first with the, with the BM in piano and the Master of Music in Musicology, that was the book. We use that was the method Walter Piston, and it's still being used in the United Kingdom and probably even the United States. Yeah, no. uh, the first part could be quite interesting in the sense, well, yeah, it depends on the person's interest because it is historical. It gives you an idea of uh, yeah, first what is Arzuela and the Arzuela in Spain and the Arzuela in the Philippines. So no, and then. I follow with the analysis, with the musical analysis. And that occupies, I would say, a big part of it. And then later on, I make my conclusions and evaluation based on this, on the analysis. Yeah. Much has been written about the dramatic aspect of the Sarzuela in the Philippines, but hardly ever on its music. More often than not, Ezerzuela was noted down as the work of only the librettist rather than the joint attempt of both the librettist and the composer. Indeed, this has become an unfortunate fallacy 
because this Arzuela would not be what it is without its music. The misconception that the composer works for rather than with a librettist stems from the fact that the librettist often accom accompanied also the roles of administrator, troupe organizer, dramatic director, and coach. Except in rare cases, he usually kept the manuscript copies of both the librettist and the music because he was responsible for subsequent presentations. In connection, I would like to quote Dr. Antonio Molina, composer of the music for the Sarsuela, Ana Maria. I found this among the Severino memoirs and collections. In a published interview I had with him earlier, he said, I was commissioned to write the music for this Arzuela and then gave its musical manuscript to Severino Reyes. I never knew what happened to it after the age of this Arzuela passed away. I was even surprised to know that it is still intact. Now, one must separate the librettist's role as an administrator from his role as an artist. The creation of half a sarsuela does not depend on one's administrative abilities but on his sensitive artistic nature. The other half is contributed by another artist, the composer, who works on an equal creative footing with the libertist. Sarsuelas, operetas, musicals, and the like all belong to the same genre of musical comedy since both dramatic and musical content are of prime importance in the world. For that matter, the extensive involvement of music in these theater forms is what really distinguishes them from strictly dramatic presentations. In other words, both drama and music must be of artistic significance. From the foregoing, it must be clearly understood that works which contain a smattering of music accompaniments or even incidental music may not be classified as sarsuelas or operetas. For example, the singing of a folk song or the inclusion of a few traditional Christmas carols in a play does not automatically make it a sarsuela or an opereta. As in other modes of expression in the arts, music exacts a certain degree of originality if it is to be given proper merit in the world, hence the indispensability of the composer. On the other hand, a sarsuela is not all music as in an opera. Essentially and in a nutshell, if the drama in an operetta is presented by way of an alternation between recitative and aria, in the sarsuela, this alternation is between spoken dialogue and aria. The Sarsuela Reyes Sarsuelas that covered the years 1902 to 1919 provide a good insight in the so-called golden age of the Philippine Sarsuela for several reasons. First, by way of his Angkalupi and Walang Sugat, both with music by Fulgencio Tolentino, Severino Reyes reintroduced the possibilities of the Sarsuela as an art form to the Filipino theater. Of course, this Arzuela was not an unknown entity in the country because it was well received um, by the Spanish community yeah, as a Spanish Arzuela. However, earlier attempts to adapt this Arzuela to the local setting had other purposes rather than to create a creditable art form. Uh, by way of his initial productions, Reyes subconsciously proved that a Tagalog Arzuela can both be entertaining and artistically enlightening. Secondly, and with regard to the music, the Severino Reyes masterpieces give one a good cross-section of the musical characteristics and styles prevalent during the era. In a total of 20 sarsuelas, Reyes worked with nine different composers. Of course, each of them incorporated his own individual imprint in his works. Nevertheless, general tendencies remain to be observed. And now regarding the, um, uh, the thing I mentioned earlier about Luxunang Dugo, well, I can mention it here. Pedrito Reyes, son of Severino Reyes, recounted in an interview that Luxunang Dugo was not well received because its music was on a high level, a higher level than that what the audience of 99 could have appreciated. But tastes change with the years. As Joseph Machlis expressed, I quote, the history of music reflects a steady broadening of the harmonic senses 
an ever greater tolerance of the human ear. In the course of this evolution, tone combinations that at first were regarded as dissonant come to be accepted and with time and familiarity as consonants.